This is a CBC News special presentation. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm here at a Ukrainian bakery in Toronto, where earlier this month I sat down with the Prime Minister for a wide-ranging interview about issues that matter to Canadians. Ukraine, healthcare, and the economy were just some of the topics we discussed. Here now, my conversation with the Prime Minister of Canada. Prime Minister, nice to see you. I appreciate you making the time for this. Good to see you. As always, um, a couple of issues that really are preoccupying Canadians at this time. So I'll start with the economy. I wonder if you misread how long inflation would last or how painful it would be that you only put some of those supports for vulnerable Canadians in just in the last couple of months. Well, I think every step of the way, we tried to look at being there in the right measures. The, the threat is real of doing so much that you're simply adding to the mm -hmm. inflation pressures. But at the same time, um, and this is where we disagree agreed with the Conservatives, we needed to be there uh, to support people who actually needed it, whether it's making sure that families can uh, afford to send their kids to the dentist, making sure you're topping up the, the housing benefit for lowest income renters. These are things that make a huge difference for Canadians. One of the places where people are feeling this the most is food, as I'm sure you know. They say that the grocery bills are expected to rise uh, for a family of four by $1,000 next year. Your government has implemented a windfall tax on sectors like banking and insurance sectors. The NDP says, what about oil and gas and grocery sectors? Have you considered that? Is that something you would consider? Uh, we're always looking at ways of making sure that everyone's paying their fair share. One of the things we're very much trying to do with the oil and gas sector, recognizing uh, their, uh, their extraordinary profits over the past year because of high mm -hmm. oil prices, um, making sure they're investing in decarbonization because that's uh, these are investments they need to be making uh, to ensure that there are good sure. jobs in the energy sector for Canada for for decades to come so uh, that's very much how we're encouraging and and you know constraining them to try and be reinvesting. What about grocery stores though? They continue grocery to make a profit stores. at a time when for a lot of Canadians that doesn't seem right. Um, the last thing we want to do is uh, put on a tax that people then just pass along to the consumers. So uh, we have to be careful about what we're doing. We're studying, I know there's been a lot of studies yep. on uh, what what's happening with food prices and we're looking at trying to help people. That's what we've tried to do every step of the way. Uh, but I don't think that the uh, simplistic solution, as satisfying as it might sound, uh, is necessarily the right approach here. Healthcare. Uh, there seems to be a standoff right now between your government and the provinces. Your focus, you say, is on results, not just dollars. The premiers want a meeting with you. Uh, you have so far resisted. Why not just meet with them? Why not just say, we're not going to get a deal, but I'm going to sit down and we're going to unblock things. I have spoken with the premiers. I have met with the premiers more often on health care than any during COVID, other, not quite yeah. the same thing. Well, it is the same thing because we saw during COVID the, 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 the weaknesses in our system, the gaps in our yeah. system, the challenges in our health system. Except you refused to talk to them and about the, health care funding during and, the pandemic, right? You said it'll be after the pandemic we'll, we'll have this actually, conversation. Actually, that's not entirely true. Okay. What I said is we would be there during the pandemic uh, for supports, and we were there to the tune of $72 yeah. billion dollars on top of all our normal health care spending. And then uh, afterwards, I said, yes, let's talk about the future of healthcare. And I have yeah. said consistently, we'll be there for more funding, yeah. but that we can't just put money into broken systems. We need the premiers to commit to improvements on results for Canadians. So, so you won't sit down with them unless a deal is worked out before? But I, I have been sitting down you with them. You have not sat down and talked uh, no, to them about health care Not funding. collectively. No. Individually, no. I've yeah. spoken with almost every single one of them yeah. to express that we need results. We will be there with more money because we know we need more money. But we also need this time the premiers to actually make the improvements that yeah. too many of them haven't been making. That sounds to me like a prime minister, though, who's going to pick off provinces and make side deals with everybody instead of sitting down and coming to an agreement. Okay. Yeah. If I can do anything that will help one family in one place get better services, I'm willing to do it. If not all of them want to come to the table, I will work with them individually. But I think what all Canadians need, and quite frankly what the responsibility of the federal government under the Canada Health Act is, to make sure that all Canadians can get access to universal, free, quality health care across the country, and that is what we're doing. I am not going to give them the blank check that they want because they are not making the improvements in general. Some of them are, yeah. but m many of them are simply What not. is your understanding of what more money would do? Um, more money could, could 
uh, ensure uh, better equipment, more, uh, more health care workers, uh, that more Canadians have access to a family doctor, mm -hmm. that health care wait times, particularly for mental health, shorten. When someone calls up and says, I'm in crisis, you can't say, uh, yes, you can have an appointment six months from now. We have to be responding to that. We've put forward money that is dedicated towards that, but we are not going to be giving it to the provinces unless they commit so you don't to trust transparency. Them. I think Canadians have seen that for too long, money hasn't improved health care systems, we need to transform the system. Now, now we're, the federal government's not in the business of saying, well, how many nurses need to be on a floor right. in any given right. moment? But we can say, you know, Canadians should have access to, to family doctors. Canadians should have access to this. And we're willing to fund part of it. But provinces right now are not hurting for funds. They have surpluses. They're able to send money to they their They have right provinces. now. They're not going to have them for no, infinity. Like they want a long-term health care deal. And that's yeah. why yeah. I've said right. we're there for the long term. Right. But we have to make sure that if we're there for the long term, that the results are there for the long term. I, I've talked to people on, on my program over the past few months who have come close to death on a number of occasions because they were waiting in an ER, because they hesitated to go to an ER because they were so sick. They see politicians fighting over health care and they feel like they are getting caught. And I wonder what you say to those people whose lives may be at risk because politicians, and I'm not, ju not just you obviously, yeah. but politicians can't get there, can't figure it out. If I were to send people all the money they need in the provinces, there is no guarantees that that those folks would be waiting uh, less time in the hospitals. Right now. The system right now, according to the head of the Canadian Medical Association, there is no point putting more money into a broken system. Now those are harsh words and I, I think there are systems that are working better than others across the country, but my responsibility is to ensure that all Canadians have access to health care and quite frankly one of the only levers I have is saying I'm not giving you this money with no conditions I'm giving it uh, I will I will fully uh, participate in the funding of it as long as those real improvements are made coming up did you screw up the legislation though no we continue to moving or continue well to I think everyone you've forward. been you've been very criticized by everybody under the sun more of my interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What will you do uh, when provinces like in Alberta and Saskatchewan, as they've signaled, say they're not going to enforce your gun laws? It, it's not that they're going to direct police, but they're going to tell prosecutors, don't go after people um, with these banned weapons, to at least send a message to people that this is not a priority for their provinces. What, what will be your response? Um, I'm not going to engage into hypotheticals. Well, it's not I will. hypothetical. Well, they've it, said it. Sort of, they've, they've said, said that it. they might do it, yes. Yeah. But the reality is Canadians are overwhelmingly uh, worried about gun violence, want to see stronger gun control. We have mandate we have a mandate to do exactly that and that's what we've done. We banned assault style weapons, uh, we've frozen the market on handguns yeah. and now we're ensuring that there is a definition going forward so assault style weapons remain banned. Now there's been a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation around it and I'll be entirely honest. There are some guns out there not many, but some, that hunters are now using for hunting that are overpowered or have characteristics that make them assault-style weapons, and the definition will probably catch those. And there are some people who hunt with a gun that is, that is considered an assault-style weapon who will have to change weapons on that and will have a buyback for that weapon because they're not criminals, but we are changing the definition to make sure that guns designed to kill the largest number of people as quickly as possible have no place in this country. Did you screw up the legislation though? No, we continue to moving or continue well, to Well, I think everyone you've forward. been you've been very criticized by everybody under the sun, the NDP, First Nations, Conservatives, other yeah. groups. So that indicates to me that it's not right the way it is it now. It indicates to me that it's a hard thing to do to move forward on gun control in a country where uh, the, the gun lobby uh, holds a lot of sway in a lot of places. The Conservative Party is moving far hard and uh, they have successfully weaponized a pitting of ur urban Canadians against rural Canadians. But that's not our focus. Our focus is on making making sure uh, that the guns that have no place in Canada because they're assault style weapons mm -hmm. are 
continued to be banned. But the conservatives have been very, very clear on it. They want to reverse our ban on assault style weapons. Yeah. I think most Canadians yeah actually are in line with uh, wanting to make sure that assault style weapons I, I, I stay I think bad. it's interesting that you think the Conservatives are pitting people against each other because they would say the same about you and particularly that you are, as, as they may be, also entrenching division between rural and urban voters because you rely on urban voters. So y you surely must see as well that you use guns as a political tool. I have spoken with uh, a lot of uh, rural Canadians who are concerned about the impact of guns in suicides, on domestic violence. Uh, everyone across this country is worried about gun violence, urban or rural. There may be different sets of uh, levels of comfort with guns, but taking a strong position on keeping Canadians safe, I mean, by the same argument, Conservatives say that I'm being divisive when I stand up unequivocally for a woman's right to choose uh, in sexual and reproductive health. Uh, they say, well, no, because Canadians, there are some Canadians who feel so strongly uh, that, uh, that you have to be anti-choice. Uh, that's a divisive position. If you want to take a position that you believe is right, that is not unanimous, yeah. um, sometimes you are going to have to stand on your principles. And in terms of keeping Canadians safe from gun violence, in terms of standing up for women's rights, I fundamentally disagree with many conservative politicians that still uh, consider that uh, uh, you know you should you should be much more uh, soft and and relativistic on those things uh, I think no we need to stand up unequivocally for safer communities we need to stand up unequivocally for women's rights the Alberta Sovereignty Act regardless of how you feel about it would you be um, willing to concede that there's a problem <laughs> between Ottawa and Alberta? That, that, that it needs some attention, some of your attention to, to fix whatever the relationship is, whatever the Premier is trying to uh, tap into or express there from Alberta? Um, I, I have, uh, over the course of my, uh, my time as Prime Minister, dealt with uh, three different Alberta Premiers mm -hmm. now. Um, and with the first two, uh, including Jason Kenney, uh, I was very much able to find common ground on things that we sure. absolutely disagree on, but other things we're able to work on, whether it was investments in infrastructure, investments in, uh, in the energy sector's transformation, investment in jobs and support. There's lots of things that we can work on. What would you work on with, with Danielle Smith right now? What do you think she's open to that you have to say? I'd be curious. Um, I, certainly think that in moving forward on, on uh, reaching a deal on health care is something that she's interested in. I know uh, Albertans are very proud of their health care system, but I know that it's under strain like people across the country, and I would very much like to see uh, better data collection uh, and uh, more investments in health care. Do you think that this increased push for autonomy that we're seeing from Alberta, from Saskatchewan, uh, from Quebec, comes, and Ontario with the notwithstanding clause to some extent, do you think it comes from your flexibility, your government's flexibility with Quebec? That there um, is now like a, you know, the provinces see that and, and, and want to push a little bit to see how far I they can go? I don't find that I've been particularly flexible with Quebec, except, except on childcare. Uh, where they already have $8.50 a day on average uh, child care and uh, I made deals with the rest of the country to get down to at least $10 a day by uh, in the coming years and uh, gave Quebec money because they had already done that. Right. But there's not a lot of flexibility I give to Quebec I, that I, I guess don't I, give to anyone I else. I guess I'm talking about the, the ways in which uh, Quebec has used the notwithstanding clause. You know, you, you, you were... That I have consistently stood against, that I have consistently come out Yeah, but you haven't complete. done anything. Uh, I have announced that we're going to be uh, taking right. it to the Supreme Court, uh, the pre preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause. Quebec when has will been, that happen? Uh, when, it gets to, when it gets through this cycle yeah. of, of appeals at the, at the provincial level. But Quebec has also used through the 80s yeah. automatically the notwithstanding clause. So they have a slightly different history around yes. it. But this renewed use of, think about what the notwithstanding clause is. It's a suspension of mm -hmm. people's fundamental rights and freedoms, an overriding of the Constitution, so that a government uh, can pass a law that they know is against people's fundamental rights. I'm always going to stand up for rights in Quebec or anywhere across the country. People are very concerned about allegations of interference by China in Canadian politics or institutions. I think it's, it's writ large. Why don't you, or why can't you, say more about that um, in order to sort of reassure people 
to have faith in our institution? Well, I think one of the most important things to reassure people about is uh, that our elections, uh, you know, happened properly. And the 2019 and 2020 election, 2021 election, regardless of uh, news reports that highlight various allegations, I can confirm that those elections uh, went off uh, and, and the integrity held and the outcome of those elections mm -hmm. was not affected by any level of, of, uh, of interference from any country. That, that's something, first of all, Canadians sure. can be reassured of. But we do see uh, interference in our community. First of all, the Chinese Canadian community is usually on the front lines of interference by the Ch Chinese right. uh, Communist Party. Uh, so we need to stand up for them because they are contributing to our communities. They're proud Canadians. They chose Canada and, and benefit, you know, benefit all of us with their hard work. Still ahead. What I was pushing back against was people who were deliberately spreading misinformation that was harming Canadians. The rest of our interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We are in a Ukrainian bakery, so I better ask some questions about Ukraine and, and the fact that the war has gone on probably longer than, than we anticipated. And there are so many refugees or Ukrainians who have come here for refuge to Canada uh, for a determinate amount of time. What, what do you think is the expectation about whether they will go home or whether they will stay here? What are your thoughts around that? I think, first of all, the fact that the war has gone on longer than we expected is a good thing. Um, people were expecting, given Russia's military dominance, that it was going to be over in a few days or a few weeks, uh, including Vladimir Putin thinking that. But he made a terrible mistake in underestimating the strength and resilience of, of Ukrainians themselves, but also in underestimating the resolve of uh, democratic countries to stand up for the principles and values that underpin, whether it's the UN Charter, territorial integrity or sovereignty. Um, as in regards to the Ukrainians that uh, have come here, uh, I know many of them are looking forward to going home mm -hmm. uh, and rebuilding. Many of them want to stay. They will be uh, welcomed and uh, continue to be extraordinary Canadians and proud Ukrainians at the same time. France is already talking very uh, aggressively about reconstruction, about how that has to happen before the conflict ends. They're getting private businesses involved. What is Canada willing to do on that front? Uh, Canada is absolutely going to be part of reconstruction, but we know that Ukraine needs to be at the center of it. They need to be driving it. They need to decide how they want to rebuild and in what ways. Mm -hmm. That has been my message consistently uh, as I've spoken with uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, as I've uh, spoken with allies that yes, w it's going to take a Marshall Plan, it's going to take mm -hmm. investments to rebuild Ukraine. We're all going to have to be part of it, but Ukraine needs to be in the driver's seat for that. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Emergencies Act inquiry. Um, do you think the country suffered any long-term damage because you invoked the Emergencies Act? No, I don't think. I don't think because I invoked uh, it was in there for seven day, for nine days. It did, in a very limited way, the job that it was brought in to do. Uh, nobody got seriously injured. Nobody had any lasting effects from it, um, and, it and it cleared the situation. Um, and there's the kind of accountability and transparency that the Commission's providing. I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we had to use it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to use the Emergencies Act, but uh, when we got to that point, as I said in the Commission, uh, it was one of the only tools left, and I think it was used properly. I think the reflection that we have to have going out of it is, you know, how are so many people hurting so much mm -hmm. that the anger against policy or against a particular government would bleed out into them not caring uh, about impacting their fellow citizens in a terrible way, whether in Ottawa yeah. or at border crossings or across the country. Well, a lot of that anger was about you. You know, you would see the, the Trudeau flags, and I know you, you, not, you don't want to make it about you, I understand that, but it was directed towards you. Um, and and you, you often regularly say you're governing for all Canadians, but obviously some of those people on the streets did not feel that. So I wonder, how do you reach them? How do you explain to them that that they may disagree with you, they may even hate you, but you are you have their interests at heart. What do you, what do you say to them? Well, first of all, the decisions that we took collectively as a country, and I can't be the only one to take credit for it, but uh, the decisions we took across provinces, across health authorities during the pandemic, um, we did things that benefited Canadians in general right. and kept them safe. 
Now, some will always disagree with the policies we put forward, but the intent that we had every step of the way was to keep people safe. And when I pushed back, mm -hmm. what I was pushing back against was people who were deliberately spreading misinformation that was harming Canadians, yeah. pushing conspiracy theories uh, that, that left families brokenhearted at the bedside of loved ones saying, I wish we had believed the government and he'd gotten vaccinated. I guess that's my point though, are, are they reachable, those people? Like no matter what you say, no matter what I say, can, can you get to them and explain things to them or are they? I believe that Canadians are good. I believe that people in general want the best for themselves, their families, their neighbours and their country. And I believe that if we can continue to deliver the supports, deliver the good jobs. I mean, a lot of the talk has been coming on sort of the West and concerns with the energy and cons energy industry and the concerns with the transformation of, of you know, the arrival of climate change as, yeah. a, as, a, as a, a way of keeping the West down when the reality is it is real and we can and will be making the investments necessary. The more we can show people that Canadians are able to be there for each other and we have the resources, the know-how, the trade relations with the world, the diversity, the growing population that leaves us better positioned for whatever the future throws at us than any other country in the world, then Canadians will realize that, you know what, our country's not broken that you don't have to talk down our country and amplify anger for people, that we have challenges, yes, but they're the kinds of challenges we've always been able to get through together. I think they're talking we'll down you, though, not the country, right? They're talking down, the, the, you're talking about the Conservatives. They're talking about the direction that you've brought the country and the things that they say you've caused. It's not talking down the country. It's well, talking you about your Canada policies. Well, you broken, yeah. uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, th that is uh, a, a statement. Uh, that talks down Canadians' ability to solve things and been able to be there together. Yes, there are some people, and we saw them in the convoy, yep. who really do think that Canada is broken, but the vast majority of Canadians remain optimistic, compassionate, there for each other, and able to deal together with uh, everything the world may throw at us. Thank you, Prime Minister. Nice of you to make the Thank time, you, as Rosie. always. I appreciate Hold it very much. Thanks.